Well, welcome back to our study. We have completed the first letter of Paul to Timothy, called 1 Timothy. And this morning, we're going to start on his second letter. But before we do that, there was something I neglected to do at the end of our lesson yesterday, and that was to encourage you to a piece of assignment or homework. And here's what I'd like to encourage you to do. We have studied six chapters in the letter called 1 Timothy. We've covered a lot of different topics. And for each of you who are watching or hearing these lessons, uh, I am guessing that it has impacted you at different points along the way. For some of you, it might have been the chaos in the church. For some of you, it might have been the doctrinal problems. For some of you, it might have been the relationships with people that he talked about. For some of you, about leadership. So my assignment to you would be, at the conclusion of 1 Timothy, is write a two-page paper interacting with some principles from the first letter that meant something to you. So as you read back through the letter of 1 Timothy, you say, oh, this was important to me, or this was important to me. I would like you to have an interaction with the text, with the study of 1 Timothy, and, and write about one topic that relates to where you are or what's important to you. And I'd be interested in what some of those responses might be. Now, with that in mind, we're going to begin today looking at the letter called 2 Timothy. And what I want to do in this first lesson is essentially talk about the first two verses, but talk very much again about the background. When we started our study on 1 Timothy, we said we're going to dig a deep foundation below the ground that once the building is up, you don't even see the foundation, but the foundation uh, is strong for the structure that's built on top. So what I want to do in this first lesson, some of this will be review, and you say, I remember that from 1 Timothy, that's great. Uh, what I find when I review is I remember more things than I did the first time through. But let me begin with a question, and this is just to kind of get our minds thinking in the direction that this letter is going to take. So my question is this, have you ever felt like you were going to die? Have you ever been in a circumstance maybe in the hospital, or maybe in an accident, or maybe in a situation where you said, I think I'm going to die. I think that this might be the end of my life. I was in a situation like that, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about it. This October will celebrate, for me, the 10-year anniversary of my liver transplant. 10 years ago, in October, in 2000, um, I had had a diseased liver inside of me that required removal and replacement. And in October, that happened. But what I didn't tell you when I told you a little bit about my story is what happened when I was in the hospital. I was in a hospital for eight days. And while I was there, my progress was excellent. The doctor said that I was doing a fine job. But they also said something that when they said it, didn't really strike me or hit me as being significant. They said, you may get an infection, but don't worry about that. That's very typical and we'll address it as best as we can. Well, I went from one day to the next and to the next and to the next. And one night, something began to happen to me. I began to get very cold. I was freezing cold, and I couldn't get warm enough. And, and Trudy was in my room with me, and she gave me blankets, and the, the nurses brought me this special heating pad that would kind of warm me up. And I was like, I'm so cold. I'm so cold. I can't warm up. And this went on for an hour or two hours. And finally, it was late into the night, and I said, Trudy, why don't you get home? Get, you need to go back and get some rest. I'll, I'll be fine, I think. I didn't say that, but I, I said, I'll be okay. You go get some rest. And so she left. Well, it wasn't long after she left that instead of being very cold, I began to get very hot. I'm like, oh, what is happening? I began to sweat, and I got rid of all of my blankets, and I got rid of the heating pad. And the nurses came in and they said, what's wrong with you? And I said, I'm, I'm just hot. And they said, well, we'll draw some blood out of you and we'll do some tests, but the tests are going to take a couple of days. And they didn't seem too worried, but I was worried. By now it was midnight and then it was one o'clock in the morning and I wasn't sleeping at all. I was miserable. I was feeling awful. And in that night of infection, I thought I was going to die. I, I remember praying desperately to the Lord. You took me through this transplant. The surgery went fine. I feel terrible. Am I going to die? And I began to pray for my wife. I began to pray for my children, each of them by name. We didn't have Sasha at that time. We just had our three. 
And they were very young. They were six and four and two years old. And I said, Lord, I'm their father. Please take care. And I was just pleading before the Lord. And I remember I was laying in my bed. If you can imagine me laying in my bed and my, my head was tilted up, kind of like this position. And across the room from me was a clock, a clock on the wall that had the, the long hand and it had the short hand. And that night passed so slowly that I remember the, 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 the second hand going around the clock all night long. I watched every minute go by on that clock. That's how slowly time was going by. Two o'clock finally came. Three o'clock finally came. Time was going, and I was still hot. I was still praying. I was still thinking about, Lord, are you going to be able to take care of my family? I think my life is over. Four o'clock came. Time continued to go very slowly. There weren't going to be any results on my tests. It was going to take some time. I was just going to have to suffer. Five o'clock came. And at 5.30, something began to happen. The fever broke. All of a sudden, I wasn't so hot anymore. And all of it, because you're analyzing your body and you're analyzing how you're feeling so much, you say, am I feeling a little bit cooler? 5.30 came along, 6 o'clock came along, and I felt like, I'm going to live. I'm going to live. My wife came back about 7.30 or 8 o'clock, and I told her about the evening, and my brother and my sister-in-law had come to visit me in the hospital, and they came, and I was just emotional because I thought I was going to die. That's the closest experience that I can think of to having said that I thought I was going to die. Have you been in a position where you thought you were going to die? Part of the reason that I ask that question is, if you've been in a situation where you thought you were going to die, how did that affect how you thought about yourself? How you thought about God? If you had a family, how you thought about your family? Did it affect those? It sure did with me. See, when we know that we're going to die, all of a sudden, our life, which might seem very broad and very complicated, all of a sudden becomes very narrow and very focused. Instead of lots and lots of different things to think about and lots and lots of things to do, all of a sudden I think that I need to do this, I need to take care of this, and I need to take care of this, and that's about all, because that's about all that we can manage. What you're about to see in this letter called Second Timothy is a man who is about to die. That's why I tell you the story. The Apostle Paul was in a Roman prison, and he knew he was going to die. He didn't know what day. He didn't know, know when it was going to happen. He didn't know exactly how it was going to happen, but he knew it was going to happen. And as he's sitting in this, in this prison cell, and I'll tell you a little bit about the prison cell after a few minutes, one of the things that he wants to do more than any other is to sit down and write one more letter to his close friend and his son or child in the faith, Timothy. That of all the things that Paul could have been thinking about while he was in this prison awaiting his death, he was thinking about one young man, Timothy. He had poured his life into this man. He had taken this man on so many traveling adventures. He had left him in the city of Ephesus where the churches were in such difficult condition. And at the last few days or weeks of his life, he was thinking about this young man by the name of Timothy. The reason I think that this letter is so very important for all of us who are watching or listening to this today is we live in very unsettled, troubling times. I don't just mean in America, I mean around the world. Life is complicated. Uh, life is not easy. There is a lot of suffering going around. There is difficulties in our churches. There's difficulties in our families. There's difficulties in our culture. And I think that a letter like this is going to provide for us a great deal of encouragement of how to live in complicated times. How am I supposed to live? What is my attitude supposed to be like? For those of us who are Christians, for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, how does that affect how I live? how I serve, my attitude, my, my, my focus on Jesus Christ. 
Have you benefited from this teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting TVS with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. And maybe it's at this point I need to explain just for a moment what, he, what I mean when I say a follower of Christ or a Christian or a believer. I would simply say that it's a Christ follower who recognized that we are sinners by birth and by heritage, but also by our actions. And that we, that there is a holy God who cannot tolerate even one sin. That we as sinners who sin cannot, will not, will never be good enough to stand in the presence of God on our own merits. We can't work hard enough for it. God recognized this problem, and he sent his perfect, sinless Son of God, Jesus Christ, to this earth to come in human form. He was fully God. He was fully man. He lived a sinless life. And throughout that life, by the end of that life, people were so angry with him that they had him arrested. They had him beaten. They had him crucified on a cross, the most cruel form of death in the Roman Empire. They laid him in a tomb, and for three days his body lay there. His disciples wondered what had happened. Was it all over? And three days later, he burst from that grave, defeating sin. He defeated death. And he became a bridge between a holy God and a sinful people. When I talk about being a Christ follower, a Christian, I'm referring to the opportunity we have to trust Jesus Christ with our life, with the forgiveness of our sins, with our past, with our present, with our future, with our eternal state. It transforms us. It transforms the way we think. It transforms our identity. We live with a new purpose. We live with a new focus. When I talk about a Christian or a Christ follower, that's what I mean. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul was. And I think what intrigues me about this Christian life is that it does at least two things. It saves us from the penalty of our sin but it saves us to a new way of living life. It saves us to a new identity. It saves us to a new destination. So it saves us from many things. It saves us to even more things. That's what I wanted you to know in laying the foundation for this letter, that what the Apostle Paul is about to write rests on the basis of the fact that Jesus Christ has forgiven him, has made him new, has transformed him, We know the Apostle Paul to be this amazing man, and we'll talk about him in a little bit later, this this follower of the Jewish faith passionately. But when he met Jesus Christ, his life was completely transformed. One of the images that I want to use as we talk about these lessons in 2 Timothy is that of navigation. So I want you to imagine for a moment that your life is a ship on the sea. And in this sea, there are a variety of obstacles that we have to navigate to or navigate away from. In certain portions of the sea, in the northern part, there are icebergs. There are things which we can see on the surface, but which are deep underneath the surface. surface. We need to identify them, and we need to navigate away from them. There are also some waters that we need to navigate towards. We say, that's a passage of water. That's a place where my ship, the ship of my life, needs to go. So from time to time, I'll use a a shipping imagery or a navigational imagery to say, we are going to, in this lesson, navigate toward this. In this lesson, we're going to navigate away from that. And this, this particular letter, while it is shorter than 1 Timothy, is extremely practical. Because Paul's at the end of his life, and his focus becomes very clear on what he wants to ask Timothy to do and to be and how he can lead these churches. See, one of the things that I think we should realize more and more, and I I think Americans struggle with this a lot, that the Christian life, somehow, we get in the, the idea in our head that it's just about living for the now. But the Christian life is not just living for the now. It is a journey that is focused on our destination. And because of our destination, that helps us make choices about how to use our time, our resources, our energy, everything that God has given us. So that also fits the idea of navigation, that we are all on a journey, not just simply to survive today, but to prepare for an eternal future.
Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.